Well, in our uh, Christmas season, we often uh, remember, of course, that Christ is born. Christ is among us. Emmanuel, God with us. The way I think about that. Emmanuel, God with us. That somehow God is with us. Well, one of the things... Uh, that we're going to be doing coming up for the next, oh, months is we're going to be heading through the Gospel of Mark. And we started that today, our journey through Mark's Gospel. And and, uh, uh, what what, what happens in our heads around the Gospels, I think, is we often kind of push them all together. I mean, there's four Gospels, and they each kind of have their own unique sound or voice. And uh, in in our minds, we just kind of lump them all together. So the story of Jesus, you know, has... uh, uh, Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem, and, and, but Mark doesn't have that, right? Uh, nor does Matthew or John. And then we have the wise men, which is only in Matthew, and we put all this kind of stuff together, and we make these nice little uh, uh, nativity scenes out here. And, and that's fine. We, we can put them together. There's, it's not a terrible thing. But sometimes I think it's worth taking the time to just imagine them singing solo, if you will, to just hear this one voice and let it sing it solo, and have its own characteristics. And, and I encourage you as we go through Mark's gospel to, to do that with Mark's gospel. Just let it sing and surprise you. You know, there's a couple characteristics about Mark that I, I just want to put out there for today. There's, there's more than these, but one of the things Mark does in his writing, he's kind of abrupt, he's unexpected. He's a bit surprising. He's like, whoa, whoa, that just happened, didn't it? You know, that kind of, of way of writing and approaching the story of Jesus, which leaves us wondering, like, well, what more surprises might we get from this guy? I mean, how is this going to work out? And the other thing I think about Mark's gospel in particular is that he leaves things more mysterious than the other gospels. And I, I really like him for this. This is why he's one of my favorites. He doesn't explain everything. There are a lot of unknowns. And you'll see that in our gospel reading today as I work with it in particular. He leaves the mystery hanging. And there's something very powerful to just to not have it all kind of packaged and all that too neatly that, 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 that some things are just like, wow, how's that, you know? Wait a second, I need to know this or I really want to know how that works out, that sort of thing. And he doesn't, he just leaves it hanging a lot. So that's Mark, a little bit about Mark. So, so what we have for today, I, I want to call if Mark was a play, is act one, scene one. So the curtain goes up, whoosh, and out in the center of the stage is John the Baptist. And he's, not, he's out there in the wilderness by this Jordan River, and the wilderness is desert. You know, other than right out next to the Jordan River, of course, there's green stuff because there's water, but as soon as you get away from it, it's just this desert. There's places, there's not even a plant growing, rocky desert, just bleak going up away from the Jordan River. So this is where he's at. He's out here, the curtain's gone up, and here we have, and we're, we're told just the minimalist bit about him, that he's preparing the way for the Lord. He's got a mission from God, and he needs to prepare the way for the Lord. So what is he doing out there, out in this desert wilderness area? Well, he's having people come out and baptizing them. Uh, they're forgiven for their sins, and they're saying, you know, we're going to live differently. Repentance is a change in your thinking about how you're going to live. So he's, he's out there basically renewing them in their faith life. He's preparing the way for the Lord, renewing them in their faith life. But there should be a little catch to you in this if you were back in that day. There should be this question in the back in the mind, of course, and why is he out in the wilderness? That's not where you do this kind of stuff. They've got this gorgeous temple sitting there in Jerusalem, in the capital city, where God is supposed to dwell in the Holy of Holies, and he's not there. Why is he way over here? This is the wrong place. Well, your mind starts wondering. You think, well, there must be something really wrong with what's going on in Jerusalem and at the temple. There's something fundamentally wrong there That because what's the temple's mission? To renew people in their life and their faith in God. And, and he's not there. He's way away from there. And so something is so fundamentally wrong with the leadership and what's going on there that he, 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 he won't even be there. So he's a critic. He, he's seen it flawed that he's out here and not doing the stuff there. So that's how this scene opens. And of course, uh, John's out there. He's doing this thing and saying the Lord's coming and preparing the way for the Lord. And a man walks out, fully grown man. And we hear his name is Jesus. But we don't know a thing about him. He's not royalty, he's just a regular guy as far as we know it, and he walks out 
to John onto the stage, if you will. And it's like, okay. <laughs> Again, there's no Mary, Joseph, babies, angels, Bethlehem, wise men, none of that. Just take it all off the scene, man. All we get is this fully grown man. It's a surprise. It's unexpected. This guy's out there. And it's Jesus is baptized by John. And I think in, in Jesus being baptized by John, in, in some ways he's affirming what John's been saying. That people need to be prepared for the way of the Lord in renewing their lives and their faith. And that uh, the second thing I think implied in here is that some of his criticism, or at least his criticism about what's going on in Jerusalem at the temple is probably spot on because Jesus is out there with John. And of course, here's where the, uh, he's baptized and he, the water goes over Jesus, splashed on Jesus, and he comes up out of the water and the heavens open. They're torn open. I mean, whoa, wait, 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 wait. The heavens are torn open. And it says, through that tear comes the Spirit of God like a dove on Jesus. And a voice cries out, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. I don't know how long that took, but 30 seconds, half a minute. But it's a quick thing, it seems like to me. Not a very long stretch. I mean, we could stretch it out a little bit. We don't know. But it's a pretty quick scene after there that this all happens. But behind it and in it and through it, it's just loaded. It's so loaded. Obviously, uh, we read the, the lesson from Isaiah, who prof, the prophet from centuries earlier who cried out in lament, Oh God, that you would tear the sky open and come down. And that's not just Isaiah lament. Isn't that something we all can relate to? Oh God, that you would somehow tear open the sky and come down here. And what's John saying? It's happened. Crazy as that can possibly sound, it's actually happened. The sky's been torn open. He's come down and he's in this Jesus. Like, whoa. You know, when Isaiah wrote those words, he followed them up by saying, hey, we got these problems with our adversaries, but he also went to talk about his own mess of a world. And and, and he he says a famous line, the righteousness, our righteousness is like filthy rags. The reason we want God to come down is such a mess. It's so broken in the world. There's enemies, there's troubles, there's all these things afoot, and even our own lives are a mess. And it feels like God is distant, missing it. And and if God would just come down and do something, I mean, surely God can do something about all this. Just tear the darn thing open and get down here. Well, of course, in the ancient world, they had a different sense of how the world was. They had what they call a three-story universe, if you haven't heard the phrase. And, uh, and, and if you go out in the prairie and you're standing there and you look around on a nice blue sky day, it looks like there's a dome there. That's what they called the firmament, the sky, or the heavens. They really thought it was a dome. That this world was covered by a dome. The world's flat back then still, uh, understood that way. And there's a dome over it. And, and, and they talked about how the... the Heavenly bodies of planets and stars and moon and sun hung on that dome and moved around on that dome. That's the way they understood it. And that as much as God's presence was here to some extent, God knew it was going down on earth, that the heart of that was up there above the blue dome. And so it was easy when they felt God was distant to kind of express it in their own sense of how the universe was built, that God's up there and we're missing him here. Now, we don't think that way. We think We're in the physical realm. God's in the spiritual realm. But we still have that sense of, God, why don't you come through that little spiritual realm into our physical realm and give us some help? It's not going very well here, God. Look around. There's conflict and troubles and people at each other. And my life's a mess. My best efforts, my righteousness, sometimes just completely misfire. And it's like filthy rags. God, hello? Hello? Hello, come through for us. And what's, Matt, what's Mark's gospel saying? He's saying, it's happened. It's happened. That God tore it open. And think of the word tear it open. There's a lot of ways you can open things. Some of you on Christmas, uh, you know, understand this. 
There's a few among you. I don't think the most of you, a few among you, you get to that present and you unpeel the tape. Go ahead, raise your hand. You unpeel the tape, you unfold the folds, and you flatten out the creases, and maybe you save it for next year. It's okay, I'm not, you know, just saying it happens. And then the rest of you are the ones, you grab the present, you find whatever little niche or cranny you can get to grab a hold of, and you go, because you just want the gift. You don't care about the wrapping paper. You're getting inside that gift. Well, that's that sense of passion and zeal that God is showing. Okay, I'm coming down. I, I, I want to get here. I don't care what happens to the sky. I don't care if I tear this thing. I'm coming down. I'm going to be with people, with you, walking among the world. So you have that sense of passion and zeal behind this. And the marking that somehow God is in Jesus. He's his beloved son. You are my beloved son. I'm pleased with you. This is, this is the one. The act one, scene one. Whoa. I think of our prayers. How many of our prayers are something to the effect of God come and help? This person's sick over here, God. Come, please, uh, we, we pray that you might make them well. Like God, again, for us, it's God's in the spiritual realm. He's got to come through that barrier, whatever that is, into our physical realm and help us here. That God is in the spiritual realm, and I'm not doing very good in my life here, that God needs to, to somehow break through that and come through and help this place where I'm, you know, whether I'm you know, maybe struggling at my job or whatever it is, that God needs to come through that realm and come and help me here. That God is still this sense of God needing to break in. We still have that, don't we? And we still sometimes feel like God is just stuck on that other side, not in this side. Mark's gospel say, no. Ripped it right open and here. And for me, Christmas is that, that sense, that growing awareness that that indeed is the case. That we're invited to walk with this unexpected, crazy mystery that it isn't that God is in the spiritual realm or up above the dome in the higher where else we kind of push God away to, that God is with us. Now, walking among us. That that mystery is true. And it is a mystery, isn't it? Don't you have the questions flying <laughs> in the back of your head? How come, well, how come if God's among us and walking among us somehow here, how come we don't, you know, know that or see that or it's not working out the way I would hope God to, you know? I mean, the, the, the unexpected, strange mystery of Jesus coming as this plain guy, God coming as this plain guy, of course, is there's not a lot of power with that. And isn't that what we want from God? power to fix everything, power, you know, it's not happening there. So what is going to happen? Well, I would have you invite you to tune into the rest of the story because it keeps unfolding here. What is God like as while God walks among us? How is that going to be? But, but just the fact that God is among you and I changes it. It shifts something inside. If you really believe as we're walking and down the road, as we're going among the people out there on the streets, at our work, or wherever we're hanging out, that God is there mixed, I think it shifts things. That God doesn't have to tear it open anymore. That God somehow is there. I think it shifts things. Let me give you an example of that. It's a, 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 one of my old favorite stories. It's about a monastery that was in deep conflict. They had jealousies over who got to do what, and, and they all wanted special privileges, and they just weren't getting along at all. And, and it was getting worse, and the abbot was fed up, so he took a couple of his top monks, and they went out to the old wise hermit that lived in a hermitage, you know, a few miles away from the monastery, all by himself in a single hermitage. And so they all troop out there, and they, they talk to the, the, this, uh, pour out their souls about how it's in conflict, and they can't make it go very well, uh, la di da di da and just laying it all out for this uh, hermit. And the only thing this old hermit says is, the Lord is one of you. And they go, what? That's all he says. The Lord is among you. That's all he says. 
And they look at him, and they was expecting more, and he says no more, and he goes back to his prayer, and he sits there, and finally they, they go back to the monastery. And of course, this just leaks out through all the brothers, and in the, in the monk, and then the monks, you know, all the brothers, they're all whispering around, the Lord's among us, the Lord's one of us. What are we going to do? What are we do? How's this going to work out? Well, it immediately worked out. They started looking at each other different. They just imagined, maybe the Lord is one of us, one of us. Which, which one? And, what's, and all of a sudden, the conflict, the jealousies, they all start going down in lower levels. And the harmony and the love they had for each other started going up. That's something right there, isn't it? The Lord is one of you. 2020. Imagine that. Not that God has to break in and come, but that God somehow is here among us, one of us. Oh, it's him sing. I don't get to go sit down. <laughs> so we'll do the first last verses of uh, uh, some of the... Uh,